Good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder and this is BRN AM for Monday, September 30th, 2019. Here are your top stories. Older generations and women are starting businesses at a faster clip. And doing good is also doing good for business. It's Social Media Monday and that means we get to take a look at some of the hard, fast trends happening on social media. And I said at the top of the hour, older generations and women are starting businesses. Well, for all this and more, let's check in on Social Media Monday with LinkedIn's Senior Financial Services Editor, Mr. Devin Banerjee. <laughs> one more time, sorry. Three, two, one. Well, for all this and more, it's Social Media Monday, and let's check in with Devin Banerjee. He's a Senior Financial Services Editor with LinkedIn. Hi, Devin. How are you? I'm doing great, Jeff. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm doing well. Looks like you're in a new location today. This is uh, LinkedIn's Washington, D.C. office. It's quite uh, cozy. It's a smaller office than the ones I'm used to. But yeah, I was in town for a conference speaking about... Uh, executive communication. So I'm uh, here for a couple of days. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And I think you heard my uh, entry point in terms of uh, the headlines. What's top of mind for you and the folks uh, this morning at LinkedIn? Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. A couple of really interesting stories I want to highlight today that we've been featuring on the platform and seeing some great conversation around. The first is some new cohorts of business owners emerging in America and actually globally. The first I'll touch on is women-led businesses. So from 2014 to 2019, here in the U.S., we saw uh, women-founded businesses accounting for the biggest growth in, in new companies. This is uh, pretty recent data out of the, uh, the Census Bureau. So new business growth overall during those five years, 2014 to 19, was about uh, pu uh, plus 9%. But growth among women-led businesses was 21%, quite a huge delta yeah. there. And even more interesting and impressive, candidly, was the growth of firms uh, run, uh, run and founded by women of color. That growth was almost five times the pace of all others. Some of the interesting cities here that we saw this growth in, Detroit, Charlotte, Atlanta, Austin. And really, you know, this dovetailed with another story we featured last week, which was the growth also in uh, companies started by people age 55 to 64. So another cohort that we don't really think of as entrepreneurs really um, in this country. Um, 26% of entrepreneurs uh, in recent years were people in this in this age group. That's up from just 15% about 25 years ago. So a huge, a huge jump. That's um, data, by the way, from, from the Kauffman Foundation. And globally, that age group, by the way, accounted for the largest growth in new businesses around the world. And so really the you know the theme of these of, of all of this data is that capital and opportunity and you know societal even societal kind of uh you know approaches and people's belief toward who is an entrepreneur are all really changing and i think you know as the finance editor and someone who's talking to to asset owners and sources of capital a lot i can i can really see that um that that's one of the biggest driving factors is that the these the sources of investment are really waking up to a wider group of of potential sources of, of entrepreneurship. And that includes women, women of color, and people in that 55 to 64 year old age group. Yeah, it's uh, certainly um, amazing statistical information. And I wonder if it's some of it, you know, we've talked over the years, Devin, about maybe uh, s salary stagnation, uh, people not being able to achieve uh, parity in terms of what they're earning relative to some of their, their other gender counterparts. And I wonder if this is a result of that. People just saying, look, I've got a lot of skill. I've got a lot of capability. I want to do something on my own. And at the end of the day, 
I'm going to own it. You think there's some of that embedded there? Yeah, the, the interesting thing about the conversation that happened on the platform is we did see people on both ends of the spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, it's people who have earned a lot over time and now have a self-funded uh, uh, route to, to starting a business. So especially those people in that 55 to 64 age category, you know, a lot of them are people who actually have capital and they're looking to put some capital to risk. And mm -hmm. that's why they're starting a business. And we saw a few people on the other topic of, of women led businesses. Um, and, you know, we, and, and then we saw a couple on the other end of the spectrum who see an opportunity to earn more, you know, higher risk, higher return, um, taking the route of entrepreneurship. But I would say generally, Jeff, you know, taking that route of, uh, of starting a company yourself, really, I think to, it's, it's more geared toward the people with who have collected resources, financial resources, resources over time, more than those who are looking for some kind of spread or, or jump to, to earn more, because it takes a lot of investment yeah. from your own pocket, takes a lot of opportunity cost and time that you may not be earning a, a steady salary. Um, so I think we see more people um, with resources taking this, this leap of faith. Yeah, certainly from my perspective as an entrepreneur, not for the faint of heart, a lot of sleepless nights on my part, whether or not things are going to work out. And I'm wondering, shifting gears from uh, the women-led businesses back to the retiree, the uh, maybe the uh, boomer-aged uh, folks, um, is that just a sense of similar sense where I've earned my keep, I've gotten this far, and I'm going to define retirement in my own terms? That seems what it says to me, but what, it, what, it, what, is, what are people on the platform taking away from this? Yeah, that's certainly a, a, one of the driving factors. We saw a few people come out and say, uh, look, I want to keep working longer. I know I'm going to be living longer. I want to keep earning longer. But also we see them really bringing something to the table for younger entrepreneurs. I mean, younger entrepreneurs, I think, are realizing that they, can, that they really need um, that expertise, that industry experience, sometimes that capital from from uh, people in this age group, their relationships. I mean, we're seeing this on the largest scale, by the way, at big unicorn startups where people realize they need that quote unquote adult in the room sometimes to, to, to help guide a company. But I think we're seeing it now also on the smaller scale. Entrepreneurs realize that teaming up, that intergenerational partnership is actually really valuable both for the younger entrepreneur and the older entrepreneur and it makes the business better each of them brings something really valuable to the table yeah well there's something certain to be learned from everybody around the room and you know what Devin, i love about this is that number one that we're kind of in a volatile market and people have been you know people that you follow i follow that we watch on tv have been saying we're going to have a recession and they've been saying it for the last five years, we're going to have a recession. And I'm sure we're going to have a recession at some point. But that even with some of these markers out there, these economic markers, that people are willing to take risks. That's number one. And number two, what I love about it is most Americans are employed by small businesses. And this means more job opportunities for seniors, for new college graduates, and people from all ends of the spectrum to learn and to grow and to learn new skills, something that you often talk about. That's absolutely true. And we see that anecdotally in the comments and the stories that people bring to the platform when we feature these items, these news items, which is that small businesses are, you know, the backbone of people say the backbone of the U.S. economy. But people really think about local communities and economies and they're bringing products and services and offerings to people around them who, where there's a demand for it. And people just love being, the people who are entrepreneurs really, really love it. As you say, it takes a lot of, you know, willpower, um, some risk, some sleepless nights. So you have to love it. And we really see people loving it. Absolutely. But Devin, let's take a little bit of a break. When we come back, I know you've got another great story. It's, it's kind of similar in this, but, but one that I think is focused on, can companies do good by doing good. So you'll stick around? Let's do it, yeah. And when we come back, Devin's gonna stick around and we're gonna talk about how businesses that do good actually do good. Stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer healthier, 
and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Welcome back. According to the National Bureau of Economic Research, a recent study shows that businesses that actually do good and embrace a mission are actually doing well. Staying around with us to discuss this, Devin Banerjee, well, welcome back. And, you know, Social Media Monday is one of our highest viewed days of the week. And I think a lot of that's because of Devin Banerjee, who is still with us. He's tracking the conversations on LinkedIn, he, he and his colleagues, because it's not just, it's Devin. Devin, what else is top of mind for you and, your, and the folks at LinkedIn this week? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, one of the great stories we feature that started a, a really passionate conversation was around that question of whether companies can do you know, well by doing good. And uh, we see a lot of data on this come out from different sources, but a recent study just published a couple weeks ago on September 9th by the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research, which you know, has a lot of clout and, 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 and has a lot of respect and credit. Um, it did the study that found that firms that embrace some kind of mission beyond just profit really do attract more workers, higher quality workers, and workers who are more productive, make fewer mistakes, et cetera. So these researchers, it's such a cool story. They actually launched a business themselves. Um, it was a business where they were looking for people to analyze, um, I think, Google Street Views and input data uh, based on what they were finding for real customers for other companies. So these researchers put together this company, started recruiting applicants via Craigslist in 12 different cities around the US and had a control group and a group that was seeing the company's image as being a do good company. So to, to that latter group, you know, they told people that this company is improving, for example, access to education in, in, in its communities. Um, it's providing jobs. Uh, it even indicated that it's, that it's a not-for-profit organization. And what the researchers found is that that latter group who was seeing the image of the company as a do-good company, as a company that had a broader mission, actually was receiving a 25% higher number of applications. Mm. More than that, they were much higher quality people. So the workers who, who, who saw the company with that latter image were more productive, they made fewer mistakes, they were actually willing to do the work for less, which which I know you know sounds like a bad thing for workers. But if you think about the company's point of view, where, where you know they're they're looking for cost effective labor, it was a it was a big benefit for the company from that perspective. And so you know what the researchers really found is that people people want to do good when they're looking for work. You know they're not just looking for a paycheck. This is something you and I talk about all the time, but we're starting to see data like this that that really you know, it that really proves it out. Um, you know, people, when they see a company that has a larger mission, that thinks about the community in which it operates, or a mission that's not just for profit, um, you know, they're more productive, they make fewer mistakes, they're more excited to come to work every day, basically. Yeah, I, I think people 
want to be part of something bigger than themselves. Devin, is this a case where maybe the for-profit companies are trying to, trying to leverage some of the messaging for not-for-profits that you typically see with a not-for-profit that are very issue-driven, whether they're for uh, hearing or speech impairment or, or the environment? Is, is that what we're seeing here? It's, it's such a great question. It's really top of mind for me. As I mentioned, I'm in Washington, D.C. today. I just was speaking at an executive communication conference, and I've got to say the overarching theme overwhelmingly was about how executives and companies generally are really digging deep and looking for what their mission is beyond just profit or return for shareholders. And then they're communicating that as strongly and via as many distribution channels as they can. One, for recruitment, um, as, as we've just been talking about, it recruits better people, more productive people, people who are more loyal uh, to the company. Two, as we've talked about in the past, it affects um, customers and sales, basically. We're seeing customer awareness of companies' missions and values, you know, much more acute in their mind. And three, it actually does appeal to investors and shareholders, which, you know, was the legacy primary stakeholder. You know, we're seeing more and more of those pools of capital be attuned to you know, their their portfolio companies or the companies in which their funds are invested and their values and their mission. So it's such a top of mind issue right now for executives, for communication and marketing teams, for companies generally that and, and it's not just I mean, obviously we do. There are some companies that are just slapping on labels yeah. and saying, you know, we're friendly to these groups, to these groups, to the environment, et cetera. But what I've noticed in my conversations with companies and executives is, as I said, they're really digging deep and realizing that they do have, you know, values and and and, and other kind of mission-driven initiatives that are not just related to profit and shareholders, and they just need to unearth those and kind of reveal them to the public and talk about them in more practical ways that reach a, a, a wider relevant audience, basically. Yeah. Yeah, it's no longer the zero ones anymore on the balance sheet. I think people want to believe and, and they want to see the proof that people are committed to doing more. And the companies that do that and they're not just slapping on brands and logos and just saying it and going through the motions are going to excel and they can still be profitable, which is amazing. Devin, always a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks so much for taking time out of your day, out of your morning in Washington, D.C., Go enjoy the rest of your day and uh, check out some of those great uh, museums. Absolutely, Jeff. Thanks a lot. And folks, that wraps up this episode of BRN AM. Hey, have a financial topic or someone of interest you think we should interview? Drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the news in retirement, markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, check out today's edition of The Morning Pulse. So until tomorrow, I'm Jeff Snyder. Keep on saving and don't forget, roll with the changes. Waiting here for you to take and drink of. But if you're tired of the same.